Welcome to This Week in Hearing. Hi, I'm Bob Trainer, your host for our special segment on giants in audiology. We're going to begin the year with a very special guest. If you've studied anything in the area of central auditory uh, assessment, central auditory anatomy physiology, brainstem anatomy physiology, and brainstem assessment, you will certainly recognize Dr. Frank Music. I want to thank Frank for sharing with us today his journey uh, through his career in audiology. And uh, thanks so much for being with us, Frank. We very much appreciate your time, energy, and effort that has gone into the preparation for our discussion today. Bob, I'm, I'm first of all uh, pleased for the opportunity, and it's always nice to talk with you, and uh, I'm looking forward to an uh, interesting conversation here. Great. Well, before we get going, I want to uh, read your bio for the group so everyone can appreciate where we're going with this discussion. Dr. Frank Music is a renowned hearing researcher scholar, teacher, and clinical audiologist. His research on electrophysiology, central auditory processing, and neuroanatomy has led to the discovery and implementation of numerous assessment tools that are widely used for assessment of the auditory brainstem and central auditory pathways. His research has contributed in a substantial way to our fundamental understanding of neuroanatomy, neurophysiology of the human auditory system, and the emerging field of neuroaudiology. He was a recipient of the James Jurger Career Award for Research in Audiology by the American Academy of Audiology in 2007, the recipient of the American Speech Language Hearing Association Honors of the Association for audiology and audiology neuroscience in 2010, and received the Royal Arch Gold Medal Award for research in central auditory disorders in 2020. Dr. Music has published over 180 peer-reviewed articles in journals that are audiology journals, but also journals outside of our uh, area as well, and authored or edited 11 books. I want to welcome Dr. Music to Giants in Hearing, and thank you very much for being with us today, Frank, and sharing your journey through audiology with us. Well, Bob, first of all, thanks for the introduction, and I appreciate that, and um, yeah, I started out at Edinburgh um, because primarily I uh, uh, was interested in continuing uh, sports, uh, playing football, which kind of got me to college. If it wasn't for that, I don't think I, I may not have even gone or at least gone for a while. Um, but Edinburgh was close by. It was an opportunity for me to go there and to continue to continue in sports. And, you know, as a teenager, those things strike you first. But I actually was was a was a biology major, and uh, later in my uh, uh, time there at Edinburgh, I picked up a course uh, in audiology because I was interested in hearing. And uh, because of that, I kind of got interested into the hearing aspect of things, and uh, was able to collect a few more hours that were needed that uh, allowed me to get into. Uh, uh, a master's degree program uh, uh, later on. But uh, actually, uh, my interest was in biology, and I was always interested in how we could understand what the brain was doing um, by measuring different kinds of visual and auditory manipulations, uh, even as an undergraduate. That always kind of uh, baffled me as to how we could understand what the brain was doing uh, by going through sensory systems. And I, I kind of, I guess I kind of stayed with that. But there was another activity that was quite a part of your life there at uh, Edinburgh. And I understand it was in addition to football. 
I was a, a Olympic competitive weightlifter and was ranked nationally um, for a, a couple years towards my end of my time at Edinburgh and then for a couple years after. And I devoted an awful lot of time to that and uh, uh, was kind of on track to be one of the Olympic candidates, but uh, some bad injuries uh, bothered me at that point in time and I, I failed to make that. But uh, that was a big part of what I did, especially uh, in uh, the couple of years after I after I graduated. So sports are a big part of my life and and it's been a big part of my family and my two boys were outstanding athletes uh, too. So uh, yeah, that was a big part of, of what I did and uh, gave me some grounding in terms of competitiveness as well as uh, uh, I guess tenacity, which you learn in sports. And none of us ever have enough money to go to school, particularly as undergraduates. And you had some summer positions that took you that you took between the years of your education. Yeah, you're right. Uh, and it was very important because I was lucky enough to be able to land a summer job working on building construction uh, in uh, Meadville, Pennsylvania, close to Edinburgh. And that really uh, paid me well. It was hard work, but I earned enough money to uh, help pay my way through uh, through Edinburgh, which at that point in time was very inexpensive. And of course, that was a major consideration. And with uh, this job, I was able to, uh, you know, save enough money so I could get through uh, four years at Edinburgh. The builders probably appreciated a weightlifter to lift a lot of the things that go into the building trade. Now, from there, I understand that your master's program was done at Kent State in Ohio. And there were a number of your classmates, which we'll all recognize at Kent State. Yeah, you're right on that, Bob. I, uh, the group that I started out with at the time, we didn't know, uh, you know, we were going to matriculate into uh, kind of frontline audiologists. But actually, Linda Hood was in my class, uh, Bob Glazer. Uh, Bob Margolis was actually a year ahead of us, and Jerry Papelka was also in that class. So we had uh, quite a group of people all converging at Kent State University at the same time. And that might have led to some interesting discussions in audiology, but probably some discussions outside of the field as well. Well, there's one of the more interesting things, at least from my account, uh, that happened there. You have to understand, Bob, that when I went to Kent State University, uh, I was primarily uh, in training uh, for uh, trying to make the Olympic team in, in competitive Olympic weightlifting. And one of the main things that I did when I got to Kent State was they had an unbelievable weight room uh, out in the field house, which was a ways away from the speech and hearing center. And you have to remember that I was a biology major kind of shifting over into hearing. And so I didn't know a lot of the finer points about uh, speech and hearing. And when I went to Kent State, I was primarily interested in training in the field house uh, and uh, getting my lifting abilities up. And I didn't hang around the speech and hearing center very much. And Linda Hood was always after me, and she said, Frank, you've got to spend more time over here and not at the field house. And I kind of brushed it off and didn't think a whole lot of it. Well, it came uh, about three or four months before graduation time, and Ken Berger, who was head of the department at that time, called me in and said, uh, uh, Frank, there must be uh, some mistake here. Uh, for some reason, I don't see you down as having any clinical hours. And this struck me as something unusual because I hadn't even thought about clinical hours. And I must have missed that lecture or missed that uh, notification that we had to obtain clinical hours, much less than they do today. But nonetheless, I didn't have any at that point in time. And Ken was stymied as he said, I can't believe you've gone this far in the program and you don't have any clinical hours. Well, luckily what happened was there was a, a person there his name was Tom Bezosi. He was director uh, at of speech and hearing down in in Canton, I believe, and and Tom had had read some news articles about me do, doing weightlifting, and 
uh, came up to me after talking with Ken Berger and said, Frank, I can get you a lot of hours real quick if you just do a couple of interviews for us for the local paper. I said, Tom, that's a deal. And so we carried on. And in a matter of three, about three months, I uh, was able to accumulate a whole lot of hours very quickly and barely, barely escaped with graduation uh, later on in, in that summer. So that was quite an exciting time. And uh, Linda Hood still scratches her head and still tells that story uh, <laughs> about uh, that interaction. So, uh, yeah, I was, uh, you know, I was a little naive about what was going on in speech and hearing. It was kind of secondary in my life at that point in time. That sounds like a bit of a trade off between marketing and uh, getting some clinical hours, which I think was pretty beneficial for all of us because. Uh, without the clinical hours, you would have had some issues with graduation, and we may not have known you uh, for the uh, for all of the contributions that you've made to the profession. Okay, then we would say next was it was on to Case Western Reserve for the PhD. Can you tell us about some of your experiences there? PhD programs are always one of those things where you learn a lot and you totally appreciate your mentors, but there are always some ups and downs and highs and lows in those programs. Yeah, what was interesting about that is, is that was really another big break that I got by going to Case Western Reserve because at that point in time, I had an opportunity to uh, talked to just before I left Kent State, talked to Joe Millen. And Joe Millen told me, he said, Frankie he says, you know, we, we concentrate a lot on oral rehab and hearing aids here at Kent State. And he says, I can tell that's not where your interest lies. And he said, you know, there's a person up at Case Western Reserve by the name of Marilyn Pinheiro, who kind of aligns with a lot of your interests in terms of physiology and uh, central auditory uh, um, and diagnostic audiology. And so I kind of got directed towards Marilyn. And as I read some of her work and, and got to know her, I realized this was uh, one of the key connections that I was going to have uh, at Case Western Reserve because Marilyn was a person who um, uh, not only got a PhD in audiology, but served uh, three years as a postdoc in neurology at Case Western Reserve with Joe Foley, who was a world-renowned neurologist at that time. And so her interest is clearly in terms of how does the brain handle acoustic stimuli. And that really fascinated me. And so I learned a lot from her. She actually moved out of Case Western Reserve and took a position at the Ohio College of Medicine as I believe one of the few or one of the first women uh, professors of neuroscience. And though she was away, she still served as a mentor to me over those years and guided me, along with Randy Beadle, who was my uh, uh, advisor at Case Western Reserve who allowed me to do a lot of a lot of things that maybe a lot of other students didn't get a chance to do. One of them was actually a, ended up being a very important one and that was my interaction with a professor of otolaryngology by the name of Vladimir Jordan who was a, a short stocky pot-bellied guy who uh, was kind of bald and swore up and down each side of uh, the page, so to speak. Uh, but he was a great teacher and had a heart of gold. Anyway, uh, I was able to take a year of temporal bone anatomy from uh, Val Jordan uh, at Reserve in the inner ear histology lab that he put together there, which was really a great experience. And it was a very tough course and he was difficult uh, at times. And I was the only audiologist there. I was taking it with uh, three or four other uh, ENT residents and fellows. And so uh, I really uh, I really had uh, my plate full, so to speak. But um, I, I, I managed to get through that. And towards the end of that year, which was my last year at Case Western Reserve, um, I uh, was talking to Val Jordan. And in his typical gruff way, he says, 
well, music, what the hell are you going to be doing here in the next year? And I said, well, you know, Dr. Jordan, I've uh, put in a couple applications, but I haven't heard anything yet. And he said, uh, well, he says, let me tell you something. He says, you know, there's a school uh, that I go to on my way to Maine every year because we have a place up there in Maine for our summer getaway. And it's a hell of a good place. It's called Dartmouth uh, and Dartmouth uh, Hitchcock Medical Center. And he says, they've got some good things going up there. It's kind of cold, but he said it's, it's a good place. But he says, moreover, he says, I, I have a guy up there by the name of Nate Gerkink who was one of my residents and took the same course you took. And he said, uh, you know, he says, uh, if you haven't heard from anybody, he says, I'll, I'll give him a call because I think I think uh, they may need an audiologist up there. And if they don't, they should. And so uh, uh, either that day or a day later when I was in the lab, I can't remember exactly, but I know I remember sitting at a desk by the temporal bone anatomy uh, microscope and Val Jordan got on the phone, not more than five or six feet away from me, calls Dartmouth, and he he asked for uh, Dr. Gerkink, and luckily Gerkink wasn't in surgery, but he was in his office, and he got on the phone, and, and I could hear Val Jordan say, well, Gerkink, what the hell are you doing up there, and what's going on, and, uh, and, he, and the end of the conversation was, well, if you don't have a position you should have and you should hire this kid, I'm telling you this right now. And he hung up. <laughs> well, believe it or not, in about a week, I got a letter from Dartmouth College asking if I was interested in a position as director of audiology because they re they didn't have audiology at that time. They had itinerant people coming in to do their audiology. And of course, I was I had kind of known about it from what Val Jordan had said. To make a long story short, that got my foot in the door, uh, and uh, I don't know how I still managed to get that position because certainly they had people more qualified than me, but I ended up there, and that was really a stroke of luck. I understand that was not an easy course you were taking from Dr. Jordan. Those T-bone courses are really difficult. Uh, Having tried to do uh, dissections on temporal bones, I, I usually ended up killing the patient each time. Um, so I know how difficult that kind of a course can be. And uh, so as you as you moved on to uh, Dartmouth, was that in seventy five or seventy six? My my official appointment was in seventy six at the medical school, but I actually started a few months early in terms of getting the clinic. Uh, underway there, which of course they 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 had a clinic, but uh, it was small and it really wasn't. Uh, it needed a lot of uh, updating, so to speak. And by then, I assumed you had obtained a lot more clinical hours. <laughs> yeah, I, I sure did. Well, in fact, you know, um, Bob, uh, this is the other thing that's interesting, is that uh, halfway through my uh, or in my second year at Case Western Reserve. A reserve is an expensive school. Uh, it's a private and expensive school. And I got through my first year okay. But in my second year there, I was running out of money to make it, uh, to make a long story short. And I really needed to, because I wasn't on a grant at that point in time, and I needed to uh, get some money. I applied for a job, I believe it was called the Lakewood Clinic or something like that, a very small clinic that had a, a small audiology department because there was a an opening there and they paid very, very well. I applied for that position and, and was able to get it uh, as a part-time student there while I was actually learning earning hours for my CFY. And Randy Beadle was very kind and very helpful in allowing me to do that, to continue on the program. And <laughs> at, at the Lakewood Clinic, I had to do everything. So in, in, uh, the reason I got paid so well is because I was doing about three different jobs. I actually had to schedule the patients I didn't have to call them for appointments, but I had to schedule the patients. I had to do everything from A to Z at that clinic. And I will tell you, as some people would say, well, you shouldn't be doing that. I learned the ropes very well from beginning to end. And it was a valuable, valuable 
uh, experience for me. So that when I went to Dartmouth and they started talking to me about uh, you know scheduling patients and how the clinic was going to run, I had all this background, firsthand background, which I think kind of impressed them, at least from a clinical standpoint, because I knew about patients, how to schedule them, when not to schedule them, how to talk to them on the phone, all of these kinds of things that most audiologists actually don't get experience in. So actually, that was kind of an interesting turn of events that, again, served to kind of help me. A lot of us, some of those uh, lower level things that we did as part of our academic and clinical journey through audiology really helped us later to do the things that we be have become more known for. So how about that clinic at Dartmouth and its development? Yeah, well, I was fortunate to lie, land in a, a department where the uh, otolaryngology people, the otologists, were very, very accommodating and had a very, uh, how shall we say, pleasing uh, and respectful view of audiology. Uh, they were academicians, so they had to publish things, and they understood what that took. And they wanted me to not only help with the clinic, but of course, uh, publish things so that they could, of course, make their way as well as uh, me make my way in the publishing world. And so uh, it was an amazing situation because when I went there, the department actually had, well, it was actually the Department of Surgery, uh, ENT was, audiology was a section under it. But they had, I had access to two, I repeat, two editorial assistants that would help in terms of publishing articles, which just flabbergasted me. I couldn't, didn't even know those kinds of things existed. And so they did everything they could to make me successful while I was there. And that was one of the main things because, uh, you know, as we uh, write IRBs now, well, we had IRBs back then. They weren't as detailed, but I hardly ever wrote an IRB because it was always done by my editorial assistants. They put it together. And most of uh, most of the time, I just signed off on it. Uh, so it was a wonderful situation, and we were able to turn out an awful lot of articles in a very short period of time, as well as getting the clinic up and going away. But the support there was nothing short of unbelievable. And uh, since then, I've reflected back on it and realized how fortunate I was to have such a team working with me. Wow, you actually had one of the first Nicolay units for doing brainstem testing. I thought I was an early guy in ABR when I had a CA-1000 in about 82. Uh, my understanding is that you had a predecessor to the CA-1000 that was at a much higher level than most of us saw in the clinic. Yeah, that's right. We had an 1170, or sometimes it's called an 1174, which uh, Kurt Hickox uh, talked me into uh, buying at Dartmouth um, because he felt the CA-1000 was strictly a clinical instrument and he felt that I was going to be doing some research and thought that the 1174, uh, which has all the components of a CA-1000, might be better suited. And then actually in the long run it was. It had great facility to do a lot of kinds of analyses that necessarily the CA-1000 uh, couldn't do. And you have to remember at that point in time, uh, that, those units were costing about between twenty five and thirty thousand dollars. I know back, I bought one. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, then you know, back in nineteen seventy six, that was a lot of money, and and uh, but Dartmouth stood up and they uh, they purchased it uh, for me, and uh, and then we were underway. We were doing ABR research in in the clinic uh, long before most people were even thinking about it. I think this was the beginning of the split brain research that you were doing with some other colleagues. Yeah, that was another big uh, step. Um, two things happened there that I thought kind of interesting stories. 
One is that in the 80s, I think that we were able to do two main things. One, a lot of ABR research on acoustic neuromas, which I'll get into. But also, I luckily became part of the split brain research group uh, at Dartmouth. And how I got that going was uh, another surprise to me. When I first went there, uh, I uh, went to the neurosurgical people. Now, I was in uh, uh, you know, otolaryngology slash audiology uh, department at at, uh, at Dartmouth, uh, but I had an interest, of course, in the brain, and so uh, my colleague says, "Well, you should go to neurology grand rounds. You should go to neuro neurosurgery grand rounds." So I did. Uh, one of the problems was that the neurosurgery grand rounds were like at six o'clock in the morning, and in the and in the winter when it was 20 below zero, it was tough to get out. But I got out and I would go to those neurosurgery grand rounds. Well, when I first went there, I went there because I wanted to get referrals for ABR, for acoustic tumor research and clinic. That was my main reason for going there, is I wanted to impress the neurosurgical people that we had a nice tool for detecting acoustic neuromas. And of course, they, along with our neurotologist, did the surgery. So that's what I wanted to do. But as I got in there, everybody was kind of surprised. But I got to know everybody pretty well, the residents, the, the head of the department there, and uh, got to be kind of one of the group. Well, after about a year of that, or even less than a year, um, uh, Don Wilson, who was a uh, top-notch neurosurgeon at that time, had decided to take up uh, the idea of doing split brain surgery for the control of epilepsy in people that had intractable epilepsy. And this had been done before out in California by Joe Bogan and his group, but they had dropped the surgery because of uh, side effects and, and it just didn't seem to be that reasonable. However, back in California, uh, Michael Gazaniga, who was an ex Dartmouth grad, had published some dramatic papers on these early split brain patients. Well, Gazaniga left uh, Roger Sperry, who later went on to win the Nobel Prize for his work on split brain, left Sperry and went on his own at Cornell Medical School in New York. So he came back east. And when Dartmouth decided to start uh, again to relook at these people with intractable epilepsy for control of one hemisphere transferring the epileptic uh, seizures to the other side in order to stop that, they thought that split brain surgery would be uh, ideal to do that. And Don Wilson decided with a new technique using more microsurgery that he could uh, do more precise surgical sectioning of the corpus callosum and wanted to retry doing this procedure again. Well, when Gazaniga uh, heard about this, he contacted his old alma mater and said, I'd like to um, be part of that research because you need a research team. You can't be doing this highly experimental procedure, sectioning the brain without research. And everybody agreed. And they said, OK, well, we're going to kind of put Mike Gazaniga in charge of the research uh, for these split brain patients. Well, this was all going on. I kind of heard a little bit about it, but I really wasn't wasn't involved uh, at all with this. I was going on and going to my meetings and trying to get the clinic going and all that. Well, as I understand it, and this is strictly hearsay, okay, but as I understand it, Gazaniga came up and had a major meeting with Don Wilson and the people at Dartmouth and his group of people down at Cornell. And Gazanigan went through the different aspects of people that they were going to try to recruit to be part of this split brain project. And of course, they could recruit practically anybody they wanted to because this was a big deal. 
uh, and hadn't been done only once before, twice before, and uh, everybody was excited about it. So they could have their pick of people. And of course, Gazanig was a top-notch researcher himself. So I guess at this meeting that was a major meeting, Gazanaga was running through the people that he was going to recruit for this research. And he came to uh, vision, he came to somatosensory, he came to the different sensory uh, aspects of research that was to be, uh, going to be done. He came to auditory. And as I understand it, again, this may be hearsay, he said, well, I'd like so-and-so to come up and do the auditory work on these people. And Don Wilson supposedly stepped up and say, we already have an auditory person. He's part of our group here that comes to our grand rounds. And it's Frank Music. And of course, Gazanica said, who in the hell is Frank Music? Because <laughs> at that point, nobody knew who I was. And, and Don Wilson went on to this tirade about how, how I was a dedicated person and that, the, that I was the one that was going to do the auditory. And that was the end of the story. And of course, when the neurosurgeons say that, they listen. Of and course. so that was it. So in a couple of days, all of a sudden, I was contacted and said, Frank, you're part of the split brain research team. And again, I was flabbergasted and said, geez, oh man, really? And they said, <laughs> and so then we went on and started to, to do the split brain research. And, you know, uh, we made some major findings there about uh, the big left ear deficits in dichotic listening. We confirmed those. We showed how split brain people uh, could not do pattern perception very well, uh, but yet we're unaffected on a number of other kinds of procedures. So uh, we made some uh, some giant strides there in terms of the audiology of the corpus callosum and uh, interhemispheric interactions. That led to the digits testing and some of those assessments that you're certainly well recognized for. Yeah, it was the reason we developed dichotic digits because of the fact that dichotic listening was one of the key procedures that showed deficits on these people, big left ear deficits, because you could, couldn't transfer the information in the right hemisphere uh, to the left hemisphere for, for linguistic labeling. And then what showed up was scores like zero. <laughs> I mean, you didn't need a chi-square to figure this out. <laughs> Uh, I know when I ran the first split brain subject, uh, I just couldn't believe it because I thought the earphone had be, become disconnected or whatever, because they had perfectly normal audiograms, great speech recognition. But as soon as you went to dichotic listening, the left ear uh, scores were essentially zero or a chance, which was really quite amazing uh, to us. And then we found they could hum the pattern, but they couldn't tell us what it was. And then we learned more about how pattern perception, which required interaction between the two hemispheres to decode the pattern for verbal report, was also markedly affected. And so those were our two major findings, but they were major and, and really put us on the map in terms of research. Yes, and another project that really put you on the map uh, was the acoustic neuroma research with Mike Glasscock. Now, how did that come about? Yeah, you bring out an interesting uh, point and, and probably another story because uh, uh, having spent a lot of money on the ABR unit, uh, <laughs> Dartmouth people wanted me to do something with it. And uh, of course, one of the main things at that point in time, as you know very well, Bob, was that uh, you know acoustic neuroma detection was uh, a big deal. We had CAT scans and the beginning of an MRI, but it was still, it was still, ABR was still a major, major factor in terms of acoustic neuroma detection. The problem that I had was as good as Dartmouth was, it was a small medical center, and we were only seeing maybe uh, eight, 10 uh, patients a year for acoustic neuroma uh, surgery and testing. And so I said, I, I have to figure out a way that I can see more patients than that. And so uh, at that point in time, I realized that uh, Ann Force Josie, who was uh, Dr. Cla Glasscock's audiologist down in Nashville, um, that group was, was turning out papers right and left about the surgical aspects of acoustic neuromas. 
So in a meeting, I contacted Forrest Josie, who's very nice, very accomplished audiologist. And I said, Forrest, I said, you know, you guys are seeing a lot of acoustic neuroma patients down there, but you're not really publishing a lot on the audiology on it. And she said, well, I'm not really a research audiologist. And I went on and talked with her and I said, do you think there's any way I could become part of that team and actually be able to work with you in terms of seeing more of Dr. Glasscock's acoustic neuroma patients? And she said, I don't know. But the thing that struck me was, I said, well, Forrest, about how many acoustic neuromas does Mike do in a week? And she says, well, usually about three, but sometimes as many as four. And I said, you mean a month? She said, no, a week, a week. And I said, this is unbelievable. And Mike was highly accomplished. And of course, uh, I, I'm trained by the house group and had uh, a, an, a sterling reputation for his great surgical skills. So he was attracting a lot of patients. And so I said, what can I do to maybe get and able to test some of these people. She says, you're gonna have to talk to Mike Glasscock. <laughs> so she made an appointment. I went in to see Mike who I hadn't known. I knew of him, but I didn't had never met him. Went into his office and I sat down and he says, well, he says, uh, what do you want to do with my acoustic neuroma patients? And I explained it uh, in about 10 minutes, uh, how that uh, we could get a lot of publications that were a lot of ABR measures that we didn't know a lot about yet that we could find out about and that it would lead to uh, publications both for Dartmouth and, and for the otology group down there in Nashville. Forrest, Josie, the audiologist, was highly supportive. After I got through with my little spiel, uh, no graphs, nothing like that, just talking to Mike Glasscock, he looked at me for about what seemed like an eternity. He, he had these steely eyes and he looked right at me and studied me without saying a word uh, for it seemed like an eternity. And he finally said, okay, let's do it. And he got up and left. <laughs> and then I, I connected with Forrest Josie and uh, uh, Forrest and I started seeing uh, these patients. Forrest did most of the testing and I did most of the uh, analysis and writing. And in our first paper, we actually published on 61 acoustic neuroma patients uh, on ABR findings. So uh, that was another big, uh, big breakthrough for us. That was one of the classics uh, of the articles that were uh, out at that time, describing how we should look for various uh, parameters and various principles within the diagnosis of acoustic neuromas. Well, that project and a few others developed into a huge publication record at Dartmouth. I think it was 112 publications, like four and a half publications per year during the time you were there. It was a very substantial production and a huge contribution to not only audiology, but other disciplines within the neurophysiology, uh, neuroanatomy uh, area. Much of these publications, I think, led to the Montreal Neurological Institute, uh, things that you were doing at that time. Yeah. Well, Bob, uh, that was a, a, a big thing to me. And uh, maybe to some people, it wouldn't seem that way. But to me, it was, it, it was kind of a big deal because this is at the time when we were doing uh, our split brain research. And the Montreal Neurological Institute is, as you may know and other, others know, is one of the top neurological uh, entities, both academically and clinically in the world, uh, often ranked number one or two uh, in the world for that particular kind of thing. And, and every year or every two years, they have a major symposium where they invite the top people you know, in the world there. And of course, everybody goes. Uh, and uh, this year they were, they actually invited three Nobel Prize winners. They invited Roger Sperry, who I don't think actually, he may not have gone there. I can't recall. Hubel from Harvard and Weasel from Harvard, who had just won the Nobel Prize for their work on vision 
and uh, ablation of uh, occipital lobe and how it affected uh, kittens and their development of the uh, visual cortex. Uh, and so when I got an invitation and knew that those guys were going to be there, I was just flabbergasted and, uh, and was uh, very, very uh, pleased uh, to be able to be part of that group that actually went in for that symposium. And I often reflect back on that as, as uh, a really a, a, a real advantage and uh, that I had uh, an opportunity to do that. And uh, some people would say, well, so what, what's the big deal? Well, you know, <laughs> yeah, to be on a, a DS with uh, uh, other Nobel Prize winners is always a, uh, an amazing thing. And I was again, very lucky, very lucky. There are very few of us, particularly in audiology, that will ever share the podium with Nobel Prize winners. What a great contribution to the profession to have done that, as well as to be involved for you at that particular level. That had to be quite an exciting component of a career. At that point, I think you moved on to, to the University of Connecticut. Yeah, and... Um... I left Dartmouth at right around 2000, and uh, one of the reasons that I left was because we had uh, lost our department head. Uh, the people that I had worked with for all those years had either retired or uh, had stepped aside, and uh, um, the research that I had been doing uh, along with the clinic and that uh, seemed to be uh, more of a difficulty than it had been in the past. And um, because of that, I uh, was really suffering from some burnout. I had been doing a, a lot of research, uh, running the clinic, seeing patients. We had uh, postdocs, uh, numerous postdocs come in that we uh, helped us tremendously with the research, but nonetheless, was a major task. And so um, I got a note from, and I had received many, many invitations to go other places, uh, but didn't. Uh, my kids were in school. I wanted to keep them there. Uh, and so by 2000, my kids were out of school and uh, the University of Connecticut wrote me a letter and said, you know, we would love to have you come down as our director of auditory research and uh, full professor and all that kind of stuff. And it sounded pretty good to me. And my wife, Sheila said, you know, I think we need a, a change of pace. And I said, you know, it'd be nice to teach uh, actually uh, graduate students uh, in, uh, in audiology. And so I took the position uh, at UConn, of which I'm very glad I did. I think the timing was really good for me, Bob, as, as it was a change of pace and allowed me to cultivate uh, doctoral students uh, at UConn, work with my old friend, Kent Morris, who was a world-renowned neuroanatomist who I'd known for a number of years. And uh, uh, it turned out really, uh, really well there. And while there, that's when you received the Jurger Career uh, a Research in Audiology Award offered by the American Academy of Audiology, as well as the American Speech Language Hearing Association's honors of the association. And this was in the areas of uh, audiology and neuroaudiology. And these are areas of expertise where many of us still have a bit of a mystery, but you have begun to solve some of that mystery uh, for us uh, significantly. You were at UConn for a number of years until 2014 when you retired from, from the UConn position. Uh, right. Well, when I was at, at UConn, uh, actually, one of the interesting things was um, when I was at Dartmouth, I had hired uh, Jennifer Shin as one of the audiologists at, uh, at Dartmouth. And when I left Dartmouth uh, to go to UConn, uh, Jen Shin decided to go for her PhD at UConn. And so she went with me and I knew she was a top notch student. So we had already started to cultivate uh, a PhD program there 
that became, you know, quite uh, uh, busy. Uh, I think we turned out eight or nine PhD students while I was there. And Jen was one of the first ones, uh, along with Pete Scheifele, who uh, actually uh, was a, uh, and I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, was a 50-year-old PhD candidate in animal science who came over to me uh, and he had a, a background in, uh, uh, in the Navy and was a SEAL and uh, had done a lot of work with training animals, uh, dogs, uh, beluga whales, all kinds of things he had done a background in and was actually doing a PhD in uh, animal science but became interested in beluga whales and how they hear. And so he actually came over to uh, the Speech and Hearing Center when I was at UConn. And he came in the door and Pete's a very imposing guy. He's a great, great big guy, very imposing, not wonderful person, nice person, but very imposing when you first see him. <laughs> I happened to be in the hallway as he came in the door and I was the first person he saw, and he said, uh, he said, sir, he says, can you tell me where I can find this Frank Music guy? <laughs> and I said, well, who wants to know? <laughs> and, and he said, well, I do. He said, I want to know, uh, I have questions for him. And I said, well, I'm Frank Music. And he shook my hand, and we got talking, and he said, uh, I work up at the St. Lawrence Seaway. And he says, we have, I've noticed up there in that my study of beluga whales is that when the major ships come in with their motors running, that the beluga whales who are in schools start raising their, they talk to each other and they raise their voices uh, quite dramatically. And when the ships go out, they keep talking, but their voices go down. And he says, that was a fascinating thing to me. And I wanted to know why that is. And I said, Pete, that's the Lombard effect. And he said, what? I said, it sounds like it's a Lombard effect, that you raise your voice when there's competing noises. And that when, when he signed, that's when he signed up to be uh, one of my PhD students. And so wow. Jen Shin and Pete were my two first students. And we had several outstanding ones after that wow. at, at UConn. With all your activity and research, you were quite active in the American Auditory Society. And as, as a major in that group and someone that, that was an officer and, and very responsible for many of the programs and so on, um, but they always met in Arizona. Now, did that lead to your movement to the University of Arizona? Right. And um, actually, uh those things happen simultaneously. Um, I think just before I left uh, UConn, uh, it was around 214, actually re retired as emeritus from, wow. from UConn there. And uh, uh, of course, Wayne Staub and I were stalwarts on the AAS meetings for many years. And uh, Wayne had started uh, this whole thing uh, that we know now as, uh, you know, uh, uh, audiology matters, audiology and technology matters, hearing and uh, technology matters. Having and, been one uh, of the partners in that with Wayne, um, um, you know, and, and had watched his career for many years as well. Uh, it was, it was really an interesting kind of a concept. And some of us, some of us, when they said blog, we said, what's that? You know, uh, and, and we really learned I what blog was, was, that's for sure. So uh, sorry to interrupt you there. It was a good story. Yeah. And so Wayne got me interested in that and uh, HHTM, as it came uh, to be known, in terms of just writing relatively what we call, you know, short five minute uh, reads on different things related to hearing science and some of the more, uh, how shall we say, unknown areas of audiology. And that's how Pathways kind of uh, got connected to HHTM, and we continue to do that. We continue to write these monthly short uh, articles on various aspects of audiology. Uh, uh, and so I got that started just before, uh, just before I went to uh, the University of Arizona 
uh, um, and uh, wasn't really uh, planning on it that much. But uh, at one of the AAS meetings, as I was about to retire from uh, UConn, uh, I ran into Barbara Cohn, and uh, there was a group of us standing outside um, uh, the meeting rooms, uh, as you know, we all do, uh, yeah. to kibitz, you know, how that goes. And uh, and so I was talking, and someone was saying, well, Frank, I hear you're leaving uh, UConn or retiring from UConn. I said, yeah. And he said, well, what are you going to do next? And he said, I said, well, I don't know. I've got some leads. I might do some part-time work down at the University of Florida, which I did have. Uh, my mother-in-law lived down there, and my wife, Sheila, was interested in going down there. And I know that they were interested in me coming there to do some uh, teaching and that. And I said, uh, well, I'd like to do some teaching someplace, at least do, I don't want to retire entirely. Barbara Cohn was standing next to me, and she said, well, Frank, what about Arizona? Have you thought about coming to Arizona? And I said, we hadn't really, but maybe we should. And she th said, well, if you do, come here. Um we have a job for you. <laughs> and and I, I kind of said, well, you know, I'd like to do some teaching if that's a possibility. And she said, oh, yeah, that's a, a possibility. Well, of course, you don't think anything of those things because that happens all the time at these meetings. Right. People say, oh, yeah, come and join us. You know, we'll, we have a great time there. We can do this and we can do that and all that. Well, about 10 days later, I got a letter from the department head saying, we hear that you might be interested in moving to Arizona, and if you do, we would really like to have you entertain coming to join our faculty. We'll make a long story short. Uh, that worked out really well. Uh, it was kind of a little bit of uh, easing up on my uh, how activities, but I think it fit well for them and it fit well for me so that I didn't have to retire entirely, which I didn't want to do, and I think it filled a kind of a void for uh, them and uh, I'm still there. I retired actually last year, but still I'm doing some some work under special provision this year at the University of Arizona. And it's been uh, an interesting time there. We've had uh, known some really great doctoral students that came through the lab there. And, and we really had uh, an interesting time uh, there because uh, I had a doctoral student uh, that came with me uh, from uh, UConn, uh, Barrett St. George, who, when we got there, uh, wanted to do anatomy work, neuroanatomy work. And uh, at that point in time, I did not think it was going to be feasible for me to start a wet lab uh, brain dissection part of that but we were able to connect with OASIS, which is a major MRI uh, online program that Barrett and some other people in the, in the lab were very well versed in. And it allowed us to actually do a tremendous amount of MRI anatomy, which Barrett kind of headed up for us. And all the doctoral students had been involved in in one way or the other. And so we were able to do uh, quite a few publications on hardcore uh, neuroanatomy of the auditory cortex uh, while uh, at uh, the University of Arizona using the OASIS program and uh, looking at MRIs rather than uh, you know uh, cadaver brains, uh, such as we did at our previous places. So that worked out pretty well, and 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 uh, we have continued to do that kind of work. Uh, that uh, I think all the students kind of appreciate the uh, neuroanatomy, and uh, we really delved into it. But it was really the work through uh, Barrett that was able to do these programs, which are really very complex in terms of looking at MRIs that I could have never done because I'm just not computer savvy like. Uh, Barrett was in terms of pulling this together, but it allowed us to do some very interesting uh, work on uh, auditory cortex and the sylvian, uh, parasylvian areas of the anatomy using this uh, MRI, these MRI techniques. I recall from our discussions that you received the Royal Arch Gold Medal Award for research in central auditory processing from the Royal Arch Masons in 2020. But I know there was a 
kind of an interesting process for you to obtain that award and get funding for your project. Yeah, Bob, that, that's that's true. That was, that was quite interesting because, you know, we're all so used to NIH protocols. Well, for this, um, uh, which was kind of a career type of research award uh, that the Royal Arch uh, people uh, sponsored with an interest in Central, uh, the way they did it was they uh, put together a committee that uh, selected 15 people from throughout the United States that they would consider for the award. They contacted them and did a telephone interview which, with each of them. And then after that telephone interview, they invited four to New York to make a presentation. And at that point in time, they were going to decide along with some other information you had to pr provide who was going to get the award. Well, luckily, I made it to the top four, and so I had to go to New York to make a presentation. And what was interesting about the presentation was the fact that they wanted us to come in and explain uh, to the group of people that were there, which I guess is about 15 people that were there, uh, uh, and some of them were scientists, some of them were businessmen, but they certainly were not all audiologists, if you know what I'm saying. And they said, your task is to make us all understand what your research is. And the other thing is that we are not going to permit you to use any slides. You have to talk to us directly and explain verbally uh, with no slides what your research is about and why we should fund it. Well, that was a that was a little bit of a shocker to me because I hadn't done anything without slides in years, and uh, but probably more to the other three people because I was able to win the award and they funded me and really were a, a major major help to a lot of our central auditory uh, work that we'd done. A talk explaining difficult concepts without slides is really not an easy task, and you won. You've been involved in some international work as well. And my understanding is uh, uh, most of your work has been in, in Europe and in uh, South America. Yeah, I think there are three places where we've had some international um, input. Uh, one is uh, in London, uh, Doris Bamu, who was one of my, uh, I was on her doctoral committee. She was an MD, PhD, you know, in England, uh, before you can be, practice audiology, you have to have an MD. And she had an MD uh, and also got a PhD, uh, you know, in, in auditory science and has one of the few uh, totally acclaimed neuroaudiology curriculums uh, in the world. Uh, and she's, she is one of the top-notch people in neuroaudiology in the world, if not the best uh, right now. Doris is a fantastic researcher and clinician. I should say. And so we were lucky to have input in London uh, to help establish uh, some central auditory uh, programs there, both clinically and academically. Um, San Paulo University sent us um, uh, Dr. Soshot, uh, Eliana Soshot, who was a postdoc with me at Dartmouth. And uh, uh, she uh, and I still, as well as with Doris, uh, we just had a, p a paper published a month ago um, wow. with the, the two of us and on backward uh, masking and its clinical, possible clinical protocols. And so uh, Ileana was, uh, has uh, invited me down there many times and, and we have worked together for many years. And then also uh, Dr. Skarzynski in Warsaw, Poland. Uh, who we've done a lot of work with. He's invited us over there many times to explain about uh, some of our work. And uh, I'd like to believe that I've had some input to the development of one of their really strong programs in audiology uh, over there in Warsaw. Uh, so those were the three places that I think have probably had my, my most input in terms of you know, international interaction, which has really been great. And again, luckily working with really great people. 
international work is fascinating and we all learn from each other as well as we have an opportunity to contribute to the development of the profession in other areas of the world where it didn't exist previously. One place where we all sometimes fall short is those that knew us when we were young. I mean, real young, like teenagers and so on. Uh, but I understand that you've made it all the way to the wall of achievement at Union City High School in Union City, Pennsylvania. Yeah, the, that was a nice award. You know, everyone likes to be recognized by their high school that they <laughs> went through. And, and certainly the wall of achievement is something that they developed there over the past, oh, 20 or 30 years, I guess. And I luckily was uh, nominated for that in the areas of medicine and education. Um, interestingly, most of my colleagues that I graduated with, when I went back to one of the reunions we had, I don't know when it was, 25 years ago or so, uh, their, their first question to me was, uh, Frank, are you still playing football? Because <laughs> they remembered me as being primarily a football player and 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 little else. Although I was a good student, uh, that was what a lot of them recognized me as. But uh, over the years, uh, uh, some of them had realized that I'd done a little bit more than that. It's been my pleasure to get to know you over the last few weeks as we put together the segment here for Giants in Audiology. On behalf of myself and your colleagues, I want to thank you for sharing your career with us, a career that has taught us so much about so many things within our profession. Thanks so much for being with us today. We appreciate your expertise and all the contributions to the to audiology as a profession and your enlightenment on an issue that I think you picked up, at least you mentioned this before, that you picked up at Case Western Reserve as a doctoral student in that we hear with our brain, not necessarily with our ears. Well, thanks very much, Bob. I appreciate that. Uh, and you're right, we do hear with our brains and not our ears. Uh, but this has been great. Uh, I really appreciate it. It's been my pleasure. And uh, I hope you have a good new year and uh, look forward to talking to you more sometimes. Again, right. thank, thanks a lot. Be with us next time for Giants in Audiology, where we talk about a significant professional's career through the field of audiology and how they got to prominence within the profession.